Thank you guys very much. I, I definitely appreciate the opportunity. Thank you to Dr. Cassio for the invitation, all the, the kind words, and thank you for uh, Lauren for all your help in getting me here. I'm glad it worked out well. And thank you guys for, for allowing a, a gator to come down here to the bayou. I, I appreciate it. When, when, when I accepted the offer, Brett had one condition, well, actually two conditions. He told me I had, I had to shave my mullet and I, and, I, and I couldn't wear my jean shorts. So it kind of, it, it left me pretty limited in my, uh, my clothing options, unfortunately. But I have to admit, now that I'm here, I don't think you guys smell like corn dogs at all. So, you know, I think, I think, I think we're even, right? So these are my disclosures. So this is a, a, a topic that's kind of near and dear to my heart. And I know Dr. Cassio is going to get into more detail on hip arthroscopy uh, later on. So I'll kind of go over the, the background and the introduction on throwing and then the evolution of how I kind of got into looking at, you know, looking at the other aspect of the thrower, and that's the lower extremity. So as many of us know, overhead throwing is one of the fastest activities, actually the fastest activity we do in all of sports. It has an angular velocity of about 7,000 degrees per second, and there is a high transfer of kinetic energy uh, to, sorry, potential energy to kinetic energy of the object being thrown. And when we, we use the term overhead throwing, we, we often kind of imply uh, pitchers or, or baseball players, and that's because most of the science and most of the data that we have is based on um, throwers. Can you guys hear me in the back okay? Okay, good. Um, but really, if, you know, for, for you guys that work with a lot of athletes and, are, and work with physical therapy and, and, and training and, and, and rehab, it really applies to a number of different athletes that we work with. Obviously, a tennis serve has similar mechanics and similar injury patterns. Volleyball serve and volleyball hitting kind of falls into the same picture. Javelin throw, to some extent, has some crossover. Obviously, in a quarterback, um, there's some similar crossover and similar injury patterns that we see. And to a certain extent, swimming swimmers have a similar kind of injury pattern as well. So although I'm going to keep using baseball as a reference, and that's because it's the most widely studied, this will kind of cut across a lot of the athletes that we work with. So in order to understand um, throwing injuries and, 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 and injury patterns, you need to understand the phases of throwing. It's really important when you see an athlete or you're doing an evaluation or you're doing rehab after an injury, they try to decipher where in the throwing uh, phases do they have their problem. That helps you kind of focus on what you may think the underlying issue is. So I'll just kind of go through that. The, uh, the wind-up phase is sort of the... the coiling phase where you gather your potential, uh, your potential energy, the center of gravity is raised, and there's really minimum stress on the shoulder. Now, if you look at lower extremity EMGs, um, you, you start to see some firing of, of the quads and the hamstring and start to see some of the, the pelvic balance uh, muscles beginning to fire. Early cocking is the initial abduction of the arm. You start to initiate external rotation. And if you look at the EMG during this phase, you see early deltoid firing and later rotator cuff activation. Late cocking, this is the, the phase where if a player comes in and, and they say, you know, I'm feeling kind of pain deep in my shoulder or my arm gets way back, um, you know, that, that's the late cocking phase. And I start thinking about labral pathology or undersurface rotator cuff tear pathology. And that's due to internal impingement and things I'm not going to get into a lot of detail on, but, but that's the phase where you get that contact with the posterior labrum and the undersurface of the rotator cuff. You start to see a posterior translation of the humeral head, which, which can be a pathologic issue, especially if you have tight posterior capsule, which leads to this posterior superior translation and can lead to this internal impingement phenomenon. And if you look at the lower extremities, you see quad firing of the lead leg and quad and abductor firing of the trail leg. The acceleration phase is the most rapid phase. This is a rapid internal rotation of up to 7,000 degrees per second. The humeral head kind of uncoils as the capsule comes back to its natural resting state. There's minimal load on the, on the glenohumeral joint, and, there, and if you look at EMGs of the lower extremities, you see quad abductors and extensor of both the lead and trail leg firing. And finally, the deceleration phase. So this is the most violent phase, and this is the one that um, you can be most susceptible to injury, and that's, it's because it's an eccentric contraction of the rotator cuff trying to slow the arm down. If you think about you know, the rehab that most of us do on throwers, and I don't know, you know, there may be difference between here and Florida. In fact, I found out you guys, how many therapists do we have here? 
So our, our baseball trainer was at LSU, baseball athletic trainer, sorry, I always make sure I add the athletic part. I get, I get yelled at if I, don't, uh, if I don't include that. But um, our baseball athletic trainer was at LSU before he came to Florida. And I didn't realize you guys can do dry needling in Louisiana, is that right? Yeah, that's, that's, that's great, but that's, yeah, Florida you can't do that. So he was asking, can we do dry needling? I'm like, what are you talking about? And then I realized that you guys have access to do that. So definitely a difference in state, state regulations and what, what different states allow. Um, so it's, if you think about the rehab that we do on most throwers, at least, at least where I'm from, there's very little eccentric rotator cuff strengthening that we do. But if you think about the rotator cuff firing in, in a throwing cycle, the majority of, of the rotator cuff is firing in an eccentric manner, and that's because the deceleration phase is trying to slow the arm down. So if a player comes in complaining of pain after ball release, I'm thinking about rotator cuff pathology as a primary source because, again, that's a, it's a high um, stress and strain on, on the rotator cuff during that phase due to the eccentric deceleration. And finally, you have your follow through. This is the rebalancing of the muscles. Um, the posterior capsule is still under stress. So again, these are a lot of different steps and think, you know, things that are going on, but the whole process takes about two seconds. So it's not easy to always kind of tease out where the problems are, but that's sort of the first thing that I try to do when I'm working with athletes is try to get an idea of where in the throwing cycle are they having their problems. And that kind of helps me initiate and negotiate the pathway for the next steps. We know through some very good studies of the upper extremity that there are adaptations in the shoulder um, of, of young, young, young throwers, and that can be um, either acquired or they can be pathologic. We know that over time, uh, likely due to increased humeral retroversion with open growth plates, that there is a shift in the external rotation of the shoulder, of the throwing shoulder, into more external rotation compared to the contralateral shoulder. But if you look at the total arc, that tends to be preserved. So the, the amount of internal rotation that you lose on the throwing shoulder tends to match the amount of external rotation that you gain so that the entire arc is just shifted more into a greater external rotation. And again, that's a bony or an osseous adaptation due to increased humeral retroversion over time as a response to, to the stresses of throwing. Now you can see a, a preferential loss of internal rotation um, and that's due to a posterior capsular contraction, uh, contracture, and, and that's a pathologic finding that you can see in throwers who have greater than 25 degrees side-to-side -side difference in internal rotation, but you don't see the same compensatory gain of external rotation. In my mind, a lot of the shoulder pathologies that we see are due to initiated by posterior capsular contractions, the slap tears, the, the rotator cuff pathology, the posterior labral tears, those are really down the stream effects of an, of an initial posterior capsular contraction. And the nice thing is the majority of posterior capsular contractions can be treated non-operatively through sleeper stretches and posterior capsular stretches. And in 90% of cases, you can, you can treat the underlying problem. So it's really important for working with throwers to make sure that a, that a dedicated posterior capsule um, stretching program is, is really a daily part of their daily maintenance. And, and guys at UF are doing that basically every single day. So, you know, there, there are often cases that we have had in practice, and, and Dr. Cassio probably has a bunch of these that kind of maybe that change your way you look at things. And this is one case that kind of changed how I, looked, how I look at things. So this is a, this is a pitcher at UF, high-level pitcher, who's drafted at a high school, probably going to be drafted at a college who, and I think that Brett's going to get into this a little bit more, but has evidence of, of femoral acetabular impingement. You see this kind of bump prominence here in the lateral aspect of the femur. He has it bilaterally. So he has bilateral FAI, bilateral labral tears, and he had, he had to have both of his hips scoped and, and labral repairs and had the bumps taken down. So we made it through that whole process, and it took about a year to get through both hips and get through his return to throwing and back to full go. And he finally is back out there, and about a month or two later, he feels a pop in his elbow. And we get an MRI, and you see he's got a complete tear of his UCL. So now we've gone through two hip problems, two hip surgeries, the whole rehab process, and now we've got an elbow process that's going to take 12 to 14 months to come back from. So I started to kind of sat there and thinking for a while and kind of was dumbfounded. It's like, you know, we do all these different things that we, 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 we know we've studied the shoulder and the elbow so much, and we have all these, these, these plans and rules and pitch counts and, 
all these different things, but yet their injury rates continue to go up. Is, is there something else that we're missing? Obviously, we know travel ball and volume and radar guns and fastballs. All these things are risk factors, but are there other issues that maybe we don't know about? And, and, and that this case kind of led me to start looking at um, other other aspects. You guys remember this song here? Yeah, so this is the old, uh, you know, the hip bone to the knee bone, knee bone to the joint. This is the name of the song. I didn't realize it was the name of it. So, you know, here I am after four years of, of, uh, of undergrad, four years of med school, five years of residency. I did two years of fellowship and four years into practice. Now I'm kind of reverted back to something I learned in the third grade, maybe looking at the kinetic chain as to being a, uh, a, a more of a source for some of the problems that we're seeing. So. What is the role of the lower extremity? Do we, do we have any evidence or what do we know? So, you know, pitchers over the course of a season throw between 200 and 1,500 pitches. You know, are there adaptations in the lower extremity just like you see in the upper extremity? You know, the lower extremity are really the primary force generators of, 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 the, of the pitches that, that they're throwing. So if you look at the lead hip, the lead hip lands in about 5 to 25 degrees of internal rotation with each pitch. That way it helps set the proper rotation of the pelvis. And, it, and if you open up too early, and those of you who deal with throwers know that the, the, you know, you're opening your hips, you're opening up too early, and that can lead to loss of velocity, but it can also lead to increased stress on the elbow and the shoulder. We have very good evidence, and I'll show that as to why that is. And if you open too late, we call that throwing across the hip. You know, and that, again, can, can affect velocity, can affect control. So, the way that your front foot and your front hip are, are landing and in control during the pitching cycle can have large ramifications uh, on the rest of the chain. The trail hip or, or the dominant hip stabilizes the pelvis. It helps to control your stride length. So certainly your abductor strength uh, is very, very important in this setting to help stabilize the pelvis. So what evidence do we know? Well, Laudner in 2010 looked at professional pitchers and looked at pitchers and position players and they found that pitchers tend to have more of a side-to-side -side difference in hip uh, range of motion compared to position players and they hypothesized that either volume or pitching off a mound or repetitive stress can be that role. You know this was further looked at by Ellen Becker who looked at 101 professional pitchers and they, in their study, found no difference. So that they hypothesized that unlike the shoulder where you see this osseous adaptation over time, maybe the hips and the femurs don't have that same process. But this was then refuted by Rob in 2010 who, who did show that in the lead hip, so the landing hip, there was a, there was a significant difference in, in hip range of motion compared to the trail hip. So we got various studies showing, some showing that there are differences and some showing that, that are not, no differences. So I think the the jury is still out as to whether or not we see osseous adaptations uh, during the, the, the development of young players. In this study um, at a Curl and Joe, they looked at adolescent athletes, and, and pre-adolescent athletes had greater dominant hip range of motion compared to the adolescent athletes. So as they age over about a four-year four period, you start to see there is some potential changes to the hip range of motion during time. And again, with open growth plates and repetitive stress, you can hypothesize that maybe there are some changes that allow the hip to, re to react and respond um, to stress to compensate in these young athletes. This is an interesting study out of Michigan, a recent study that looked at the University of Michigan throwers, and they looked at their hip range of motion, and they also, did, uh, got, C they also got CT scans in all their, all their athletes, and all the, they did not find a significant increase in, in impingement findings on the CAT scan, they did find that almost all the pitchers were quote unquote at their maximum for hip range of motion during the throwing cycle. So they hypothesized that any perturbations to the throwing cycle or, or the mechanics can kind of tip you over the edge and maybe take you in from, from, from not having impingement type findings to possibly throwing you into a bony impingement situation because of mechanics. Because they're already at that kind of that upper limit of hip range of motion during the throwing cycle. This is a study that looked at the correlation between the hip range of motion and various findings of, of, the, of the throwing cycle. This was done out of uh, Alabama. And they found that hip range of motion significantly correlated with ball velocity, stride length, trunk separation, pelvic orientation. Uh, so significant findings with the throwing cycle with decreased hip range of motion. So you can certainly start to see that 
simple things like loss of motion, the lower extremity can then lead to issues down the chain with the upper extremity. And what about trunk sequence? Well, Oyama in 2014 looked at the, the timing of the trunk sequence and found that the poor timing of, of the hip trunk sequence led to increased stresses on the proximal humerus. Those of us who deal with a lot of young, young throwing athletes know about little league shoulder and, 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 and epiphysalysis or growth plate injuries and in throwers. So this study shows that improper trunk sequence and improper timing led, led to an increase in rotational stresses and rotational forces on the proximal humerus. Now what about fatigue? Is that a factor? Uh, Oliver in 2015 looked at uh, pitchers and they did a simulated pitching uh, game uh, program in, in their lab and they found that post game that the stance leg range of motion significantly correlated with the the scapular protraction because so again those of you who deal with a lot of rehab you know the importance and, and know the effect of, 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 of scapular protraction and how that can lead to cuff impingement and, and, and cuff shoulder issues so in this study fatigue certainly correlated the hip range of motion with an increase of scapular protraction uh, which could lead to further injury in that regard. Chris Ahmad out of Columbia, New York, New York Yankees team doc, took it a step further and they, and they followed um, young pitchers over the course of a season and they, and they videotaped the number of games over the course of the season and they found that the, the hip lean increased during the game and as well as during the course of the season. So there's evidence that as fatigue becomes more of an issue, that the mechanics get worse, which can then lead to further injuries down the road. So these kind of findings and thoughts led to us to start looking from at UF and, and to see if there were some things that we could correlate and, and some changes that we could made. We could make. So we recently published an article where we took our athletes, our pitchers, over the course of a number of seasons, and we did preseason and postseason measurements in the hip as far as range of motion and strength. And what we found is preseason to postseason measurements, you see a decrease in hip internal, sorry, external rotation, and you see a decrease in total arc of the hip during the course of the season. If you look at strength, abductor strength of the hip, we also see a significant decrease preseason versus po postseason versus preseason in the hip abduction strength over the course of the season. Now what about workload? Did that have any effect? Well, workload only had an effect in the reliever. So if you looked at innings pitched or pitch counts, there was a significant correlation between range of motion uh, in the only in the relievers based on volume. So the evidence shows us, at least in our fairly small study, that there tends to be a loss of external rotation of the hips over the course of the season, as well as a gradual weakening of the abductors over the course of the season. Um, you know, is that due to repetitive, as, as we mentioned, there's a repetitive internal stress on the hip. Does that, could that be, a, a, is there, are there capsular changes during the season that could cause that? Um, is there other fatigue issues uh, over the season that maybe we could address? As we mentioned, I showed you in these studies that fatigue significantly correlates with poor um, biomechanics and increased stress on the arm. And, and so are there things that we can do as physicians or, 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 or rehab specialists or athletic trainers to, to prevent that during the course of the season to be proactive? And is there a workload effect? Well, in our, our study, we only showed the relievers had a workload effect. So is there some threshold that maybe all the starters passed, but only a certain number of the relievers passed? Or is there some amount of throwing during a season that puts you at higher risk for these issues? Now, what about the risk of the lower extremity on the upper extremity during the kinetic chain? Um, in this study by Keith Meister, who used to be at Florida, who's now the team doc for Texas Rangers in Arlington, they showed that the range of motion of the hip significantly correlated with the range of motion of the shoulder. And we know from a lot of studies that decrease in the shoulder range of motion puts increased elbow stress on the elbow during the throwing cycle. So you can start to see a, a pattern develop where you start to lose motion in the hips that may throw off your mechanics, maybe lead to posterior capsular contractions, which lead, lead to loss of shoulder motion, increased valgus torque on the elbow, increased risk of Tommy, or UCL injuries, and a rising rate of Tommy John surgery. So you can start to see a pattern develop where maybe there's more to this process than, than, than we've kind of been focusing on. So we know that there are, there are some risk factors for elbow, for increasing elbow valgus torque. 
Uh, the study in 2009, AJSN defined these, these different uh, biomechanic factors in the throwing cycle that increased the torque on the elbow. So early onset trunk rotation, quote unquote, hips opening up too early. Increase shoulder max external rotation. Now we talked about internal impingement. You see posterior capsular contraction and you start to see a shift, posterior superior shift in the glenohumeral contact forces, which then leads to greater external rotation, which is our internal impingement issue. But it also leads to a higher risk of elbow valgus torque. So again, you start to see how these things are all interrelated during the throwing cycle. We also, we also know that early onset of max elbow flexion and a lower shoulder abduction angle. So you, you guys heard of the term, the three quarter thrower. You know, they have a higher risk of stress on the elbow by being at three quarters as opposed to being straight over the top. So we took these known risk factors that, that have been published and, and we looked at uh, seven of our throwers. We put them through the biomechanic uh, analysis in our lab where you do the high speed, high definition motion capture and take them through uh, a number of pitches using a two, two seam fastball from a mound, 60 feet, six inches. And we, we, these are the same athletes that you saw that we did the hip range of motion measurements on. And then we then, then took them through the biomechanical analysis to see if we can draw any correlations. And after you do your high speed motion capture, we did the, um, the little reflective ball things that you, you, know, you see when, they, when they're making these video games. It allows you to get these stick figure, stick diagrams, I forget the exact term, from, maybe you guys do this can help me, but it allows you to get the, the joint measurements, torque, um, you know, range of motion measurements through, through a computational design um, based on a computer program. And then we can correlate those findings with the hip range of motion findings. And I don't know if this is, this probably is not presenting very well in the back of the room. But what we found is that a decrease in dominant hip, so that the, the stance leg, decrease in stance leg led to, a, it has significant correlation with an earlier timing of trunk rotation. So decrease stance leg range of motion led to them opening up the front hip early as a compensation, which then you know, put them at risk for potential elbow injury. We also found that the a D, a stance leg total arc of motion, again, the, in this situation, I think the extra rotation is kind of dominating the total arc. But if you see a loss of total arc hip range of motion also led to a earlier opening of the, uh, of the front hip. If you look at the non-dominant, so the, the, the lead leg, so a decrease in lead leg total arc of motion led to a greater maximum shoulder external rotation. So their, their, their arm, again, that, that whole internal impingement, you know, greater max external rotation of the arm is significantly correlated with a state with a lead leg loss of motion. We also found that the lead leg loss of internal rotation uh, significantly correlated to a greater elbow flexion angle at ball release, another known risk factor for, for elbow injuries. So uh, let me just kind of summarize those findings. So decreased dominance, so your stance leg, total arc and external rotation led to earlier hip opening uh, of, the, of the front hip. Again, a known risk factor for elbow problems. Decreased non-dominant, so your, to your, uh, your stance leg, sorry, your lead leg, total arc led to greater shoulder external rotation and decreased non-dominant, so your, your lead leg internal rotation led to greater elbow flexion. And that may be a compensation with a trunk lean type phenomenon where you're having to lean towards that side and, and the biomechanic evaluation kind of reads that as a greater elbow, elbow flexion at throwing. So if you put these two studies together, we, we, you can start to see that there certainly appears to be a correlation between loss of hip motion and risk of elbow torque, elbow valgus, and elbow injury. And again, I showed you in the first study that loss of hip motion may change over the course of the season. We also know from Chris Ahmad's work in Columbia that fatigue um, and, and, and loss of uh, fatigue over the course of a game or over the course of a season is also increased. And we showed you on our study that the abduction strength of, of both legs decreased over the course of a season. So you start to maybe you start to get a picture of a risk factor that may be a modifiable risk factor over the course of the season that maybe we can do a better job as sports medicine specialists trying to maximize the hip range of motion and the abductor strength during the course of the season or during the course of their career 
to minimize the potential risk on the elbow. And that's something that at UF over the last three or four years that we have in, in employed to try to, to, to increase our hip flexibility uh, approach during the season. You know, as I said, they've all been on sleeper stretches and posterior capsular stretches for the last six, seven years, but now they're also on a, a, a hip posterior capsular program or a hip anterior capsular program or a hip abduction strengthening program in conjunction with what they've been on for, you know, for the last six to 10 years. So the future directions, obviously you'd like to have larger prospective studies. Um, you know, this, these are still fairly small studies. You'd also like, like to correlate this or extrapolate that to, to most of us work with, and that's the high school and maybe the little league players to see if the same findings can, can, can hold up. You know, or, or is it you know, the higher level athletes maybe are a different group that we need to look at? Now, it's hard to say. And then kind of the holy grail is, you know, can you define an injury risk and can you change an injury risk based on, on these kind of prehab type preseason conditioning programs that I think many of us employ with ACLs and, and, arm, and arm care and all these kind of things. You know, is there something that we can add to throwers that maybe will decrease the risk of this kind of rising epidemic of, of medial elbow injuries? So along those lines, you know, I kind of wanted to summarize what we know about the potential injury risks, and the answer is not much. Um, but I've kind of found some, some studies here recently that have tried to maybe start to look at this. Most of these studies in the last year or two have really just popped up. It's kind of a newer concept of, of looking at the lower extremity, but it's starting, it's starting to see more and more. So the guys out of Detroit, they looked at, um, I believe, the Tigers organization, and they did a hip range of motion profile, and then they had a questionnaire during their preseason preseason physicals, and, and one of the questions, have you had a history of shoulder injury? And it's not very scientific, but they found that players with a decreased hip range of motion had a higher incidence of a history of shoulder injury and shoulder problems. This study out of Japan looked at elbow pain. Again, not a particular injury pattern, but just players who had elbow pain, and they found that, a, that decreased hip range of motion, both of, of the trail and the lead leg, significantly correlated with elbow pain. If you look at hip flexion, internal rotation, and then internal rotation at zero and 90 degrees, they all correlated with, with a history of elbow pain. So you start to see maybe that there is some, some findings to support this kind of early evidence that we're seeing. And then finally, this is, I know Dr. Castor is going to get into hip arthroscopy here in a little bit, but th this is an interesting study that I kind of, if you tease out, you find this little bit of data. So Thomas Burr recently published their series of high-level baseball players. So this was, I believe, college and professional. And then if you, if you look at this group of 40 athletes, I believe, that you find a small subgroup of major league pitchers. They had, they had eight major league pitchers. And of those eight pitchers, 75% had had Tommy John surgery. Now, if you look at major league pitchers in general, one in three have Tommy John surgery. So it's not, it certainly is significant, but maybe there's some underlying um, just confounding issues with that many pitchers have Tommy John surgery but by the time they got to the major leagues. But certainly three out of four, uh, you know, six of their eight patients had had Tommy John surgery. I think there certainly is potentially evidence of, of some correlation there that uh, may explain some of the findings. <clears throat> so. It's really all I have on, on, on this kind of the, the summary of what we know about the hip and throwers. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, this picture usually gets some people you know, oozing and but you guys are from the bayou. You're pretty used to this, so it's not, not that big of a deal here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>